Good morning. I'm Rebecca, one of the pastors here at Cokesbury, and I'm so glad to welcome all of you this morning at this end of spring break week. Some of you have been away, and welcome back. The flowers on the altar today are in memory of Doris Stoughton. Her service today is at 2 o'clock here in the sanctuary, and you are invited to attend that service. Today is St. Patrick's Day. I see some of you have on your green this morning. St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland who was brought to the Emerald Isle when he was kidnapped and enslaved. And though he narrowly escaped, he returned and advanced Christianity throughout the island. So that's what St. Patrick's Day is all about. But in our family this day, we celebrate St. Chester's Day. St. Chester is also an evangelist like St. Patrick and is my father. Uh, he, he lives with us and is celebrating his birthday today, 103 years on earth today. And still functioning and walking and talking and doing very well for those of you who have asked. But uh, everybody wants to know what the secret is to his longevity. So I think I have finally gotten the answer. Number one, he's a very humble man. He's the eternal optimist. Every day is a good day. But mainly he eats a lot of chocolate. <laughs> so come on, you know, just eat your, eat your chocolate every morning. Yesterday we had a, a small family gathering and I was encouraging people to say nice things about him. <laughs> and he said, can we just skip the speeches and have the cake? <laughs> so uh, thank you for, for your good wishes for my dad. And I know he appreciates all of those. Uh, we're going to hear the words now of Psalm 91. This is God's impenetrable prayer of protection. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. 
You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. They will call on me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble, I will deliver them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show my salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. We say thanks be to God. Our opening hymn is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Will you stand and join your voices as we sing?
as we consider the amazing grace of Jesus, let us go to God with our prayer of confession. Forgive us, O God, for those thoughts and deeds which bring you sorrow. We have hated when we ought to have loved. We have criticized when we ought to have praised. We have thought of self when we ought to have thought of others. Our lives are too often a denial of our faith. Give us strength this day to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us take a moment to confess our individual sins before God. In the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. Let us join together in Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. If you receive it, 
If you can hear it, somebody testify. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. As we're going through this season of Lent, we are looking forward, of course, to Easter Sunday. If you would like to sponsor a lily to be decorating this sanctuary on Easter morning, there is a place in your bulletin that you can sign up to do that, and uh, we would love for you to be able to have that opportunity. Also, there are so many things going on between now and Easter. Next Sunday is our Easter cantata brought to us by the choir. You will not want to miss that for sure. It's also Palm Sunday, and so we we'll want you to, to be here for that, for that special celebration day. Also, today, if you will come back at 4 o'clock, you will hear the Oak Ridge Symphonia concert directed by Dr. Urias. I hope that you will join us for that as well. That's a free concert. And then uh, Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday. We will have a special time together on Monday, Thursday that week here on the South Campus as we remember the events of the Last Supper. At any time between 5 and 6.30 on that day, on Monday, Thursday, you can come and relive Jerusalem at Passover and you can receive Holy Communion in an interactive setting. This is going to be a great time for families to come together also and to learn more about Jesus and the purpose of communion. So we invite you to do that. Another new thing that is happening this year is we will be having a new, <clears throat> excuse me, a noon Good Friday service across the street as well as an evening Good Friday service. So if you would like to come at noon, you'd be welcome to do that as well. We're going to take an offering, and I want us to bring our hearts and minds together as we go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your continued presence and your love. We thank you for going before us and for covering us from behind. Thank you for choosing to be in our midst for lifting our burdens and for securing the heavenly place you have prepared for us. Lord, we name aloud the places in the world where your hope is so desperately needed. Those that we see in the news every day and those that we don't see. We pray especially for churches who are worshiping today in all of those places. God, bring your protection to Ukraine, to Israel, to Gaza, to Haiti, and to every continent where there is strife. Your words bring us so much hope and comfort. So remind us daily of your strength and may we always see glimpses of your infallible glory and blessing as we seek your face throughout our days. Victory and salvation are found in you alone, Lord. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray the prayer he taught us by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture lesson for today in our series called Jesus Loves Me is from Mark 5, starting with verses 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him fell at his feet and pleaded with him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his cloak, I will be made well. Immediately, her flow of blood stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my cloak? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. me how I know my Lord is real. You may doubt the things I say and doubt the way I feel. But I know
Good morning. I'm glad you're here in worship. I'm Charles, one of the pastors here. And I'm so glad that we've gathered here in this part of Lent. We are ending spring break, which may mean nothing to you. But we have several teachers in the present today that teachers live for certain things. <laughs> A good snow day so that you don't have to go, and then uh, uh, summer, and then there's spring break. And, and some of our teachers get to take a break and do things. I'm only mentioning this because this past week, during spring break, you can hear him laughing, Michael Rogers uh, did not make it to Tahiti <laughs> or, or the beach. He was with me at Holston Conference Minister's Convocation. One of the things that teachers just love to do on their break <laughs> is go hang out with 150 United Methodist ministers. It's just a blast. Uh, but, but I do want to point out that, that Michael and Marcella Urias were the ones that provided incredible music Wednesday for the worship service as we gathered together and as uh, Bishop Wallace Paget served us communion. So. I want to say thank you to them publicly that uh, they, they represented us, they represented us quite well and did a great job for it. We're in Lent. We're coming down near the end of Lent, and we've been, we've been talking about preparing for Easter, deepening our own faith, having a time of reflection, but sometimes self-reflection can descend in to, uh, into to isolation and being alone. But friends, our belief of God's love is not tied to our performance, to our circumstances. God loves us in spite of feelings that we have, in spite of our circumstances. And so this Lent, we've been thinking about Jesus loves us. And we've, we've looked at it in different ways. The first week we talked about Jesus loves me when I fail. And we looked at the story of the prodigals. And then the next week we thought about Jesus loves me when I'm afraid. And the story of the sinking boat in the middle of a storm. Then we talked about Jesus loves me when I'm stuck. While well, we looked at the story of Jesus and the sick man at Bethesda. Last week we talked about Jesus loves me in my mess. And we read the story of the family that tried to get uh, ahead with Jesus, James and John and their mother. But today, today we talk about Jesus loves me when it feels too late. Not that I ever did this, but I have four siblings, and I know that they all four did this. Um, I don't have a memory of it for me, but anyway... We, would, we were studying in school, and we would come to finals, or when the term paper was due, the next day. And, and it was interesting that in our family, among my siblings and I, um, our prayer lives took a real turn on those nights. <laughs> and we seemed to draw closer to God, thinking that that somehow would help us on the test. We're at the last minute. It's the last thing. I mean, we're trying to do this. We're cramming for the exam. And every time my dad would come in when it was well past bedtime, open the door, stick his head in and say, son, if you don't know it now, you're not going to know it tomorrow morning. Go to bed. That'll help you more. Go to sleep. You'll sleep. You'll, you'll do better on the test if you're well rested. If you don't know it now, you're not going to know it tomorrow morning. The thing is, sometimes we get down to the end. We get to the last, and we're scrambling. We're struggling. I, I looked up this idiom, at the end of our rope. At the end of our rope. And I looked it up, and it's great. And you, you all need to go find this. It's a, it's a website called Mrs. Love's Class Idioms. 
And it's for little kids because we use idioms all the time. But, but maybe you don't hang around little kids enough. Say in front of a little kid, wow, it's really raining cats and dogs. And watch what happens. There's this immediate bolt to the window to say, I got to see this, you know. But Mrs. Love's idioms has at the end of your rope. And she wrote, it doesn't really mean that you're hanging off a rope. It means that you're giving up, that you're sick of an attitude around you, that you can't take it anymore. The end of our rope. That's where we pick up the story today. After the story of Jesus in the storm, he's back home. And he's preaching, he's healing, he's teaching. And Jairus, the synagogue leader. The synagogue leader. Wow. He's getting some recognition from the local leadership. But he shows up and says, my daughter's at the point of death. My daughter's dying. He comes as a father pleading for his child's life. And you heard the story that Rebecca read. The crowd is all pressing around. Uh, They're saying, make way, make way. Let's go through this. Let's go try to help out this girl. And then there's a sick woman. A woman uh, that's been sick for 12 years, bleeding, which, by the way, makes her ritually unclean. So it's just not that she's been sick all that time. She's been alone all that time because people can't be around her and remain clean. And yet there she is in the crowd. She's been to doctors. She's spent all of her money on trying to get well. And she's at the end of a rope. The last place. And she says, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. I don't want to have a conversation. I don't want him to lay hands on me. I just want to get that close. And you heard is that she's, she's made whole. She's healed in that moment. But Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And the disciples say, you've got to be kidding you look around you. Everybody's touching you. What, what do you mean who's touching? Who's touched you? And, and he said, they're, they're saying, come on, we, we, he's the head of the synagogue. We have got to keep moving. We've got to keep going. And Jesus said, no, no, we, we need to talk about this. We need to find out about this. And so he talks to the woman. Who touched me, he says, and she's afraid. She's trembling. I mean, think about it. She could have just melted back into the crowd. She could have just slinked away. She was healed. She didn't need to do anything else. But she comes forward in fear. And she says, "Ah, it was me. I'm the one. And do you hear what Jesus says to her? We we read it the same way every time, but listen to what he's actually saying. He says, your trust in me has taken care of things. Be at peace. Be at peace. Your trust in me has made things whole. Well. But what about the little girl? I'm glad you asked. It goes on. Here's the rest of that story. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the synagogue leader's house to say, your daughter's dead. Don't don't trouble the teacher any further. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue leader, don't be afraid, only believe. 
Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the synagogue leader's house, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. I love that line. They laughed at him. We checked for a pulse. She's not breathing. We know what death looks like. But then he went, put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talita kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk about. She was about 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Talita kum. That set of words astonishes me because Mark is telling the story and it is so immediate to him and so powerful to him that he doesn't even translate it. He puts it in the original language because of that moment, that astounding moment. You see, Jesus doesn't berate anybody in all of this. Jesus doesn't say, what's wrong with you? I've got this. Jesus says, trust me, have faith. I mean, this is the same man that in the Sermon on the Mount said, don't worry about tomorrow. It's got enough problems on its own. Right? Now, listen to what Jesus says. Don't worry about tomorrow because you can trust. He does not say, and I'm quoting, yes, I am quoting Scarlett O'Hara. Fiddle dee dee, I'll worry about that tomorrow. Not That is not what Jesus says. He doesn't say, don't worry, be happy. Not. That's not what Jesus is saying in this. He's saying, in whom do you trust? Where does your trust lie? It's all about trust. It's about how we live in trust. Are we only confident in our own abilities? Is that all we trust in, of what we think we can pull off? Jesus is saying, have trust in me. Trust in me. You see, when we are one of Jesus' people, we bring a different perspective to our whole life. We see things differently. That's what a perspective is. And part of Living in Jesus is having a new perspective. Rebecca mentioned Patrick, who was captured from his home, taken across the stormy Irish Sea to Ireland, where he was a slave among the people there. And then later, after being a slave there, he finally escapes, goes back home, where somebody else captures him, a fellow named Jesus. And that changes things for Patrick to the point that he goes back to those that enslaved him to bring the good news of the gospel to them. Interestingly enough, some gener- a couple of generations after Patrick, a fellow named Cuthbert, who was a Irish royalty and caused and actually caused a horrible battle to occur, and then realized that he had caused all of these people of his country to be killed, and left Ireland and exiled himself to a little island called Iona, where Iona was the first island he could find where he could no longer see Ireland on the horizon. 
And he built a monastery there. And it's from that spot that Christianity goes to England and Scotland. Two men at the end of their ropes. And yet change their perspective and go and go in a different direction. It's about perspective, right? Depends on where you stand, how you look at things. The, the, our, the, the guy that was the funniest guy in our high school class, Joel Goss. And we loved Joel, but he had just this wonderful, quirky sense of humor. We elected him as seniors to be our class prophet. I don't know if your high school did this, but the class prophet was somebody who wrote a a thing and included all of the names of everybody in the class in a prophecy of looking forward 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Joel struggled over this. The night of senior night came, he stood in front of us and he said, the difficulty of being the prophet is to know how far ahead to look. And he said, so I have decided to look a hundred years ahead. He looked down at his paper and he said, we'll all be dead. (laughs) And then he sat down. It was a great moment. Our class sponsor did one of these. And he stood up and said, however, I've been persuaded to do 20 years. And he read his other prophecy. It's, it's how you look at things. I mean, it, it, think about it. You, my grandmother always told the story about the, the fellow who was walking along one day, and he looked over the fence at a farmer, and a farmer had a large hog underneath his arm holding it up to an apple tree. And the man said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm feeding my hogs. And he said, but what are you doing? Why are you doing it that way? And he said, well, I don't like the apples to get on the ground. They get all rotten and wormy and everything. And so I just hold the hog up here and let him eat it off the tree before uh, before it gets on the ground. And the man said, doesn't that take a lot of time? And the farmer said, ah, what's time to a hog? (laughs) It's all in your perspective, right? It depends on on how you look at things. When we're dealing with God, I want you to think of the perspective that in the light of eternity, it is never too late. God is always at work. God never quits working. In Moffat's translation of the Bible, when he comes to the name of God, he calls him the eternal. You see, our perspective is who's in control? Who's really in control? And that's that's what we consider today is when we're at the end of our rope, who is it that's in control? How do we see things around us? Now, by the way, before I quit, I have to tell you my favorite part of this story. It's at the very end. All these amazing things, these people hanging from the end of the rope. And Jesus, who's with us every day and each and every moment, heals this little girl, brings her back to her parents. And what are the last words in this story? Feed that child. Think about it. What an interesting little detail. Feed that child. Don't get caught up in all of this. Live life. Live life in trust. Live life with a perspective of trust that surrounds us even when we're at the end of our rope. Feed that child. Keep living. Keep being a part of things. Do the things you're supposed to do as a parent. This little girl's hungry. Feed her. Let's pray. 
Gracious God, we come today, some of us clinging to the end of the rope. It sometimes feels just too late. But you surround us each and every moment at all times. Help us. Help us turn to you with new eyes of faith that we might trust in one who holds us always. Help us see in the light of eternity that you never fail us, that it is never too late. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing, breathe. We gather together so many times in worship and in so many ways. We will be gathering around him and mourning Doris's death, but also celebrating her life. We'll be together for music. We'll be together for uh, music next week. There are just so many ways that we gather as God's people. But whenever we gather, we leave, we leave this building. And you know that when we leave, we don't leave the church.
because wherever we are, there the church is, because we are the church. Go in peace, loving God and your neighbor, and breathe him in, for he holds you, especially holds you at the end of the rope. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.